There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's commercial bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help build your future. Hey everyone, this is TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. I'm Kirsten Korosek, uh, transportation editor here at TechCrunch, and today we are jumping into the mobility world by taking a look at a pretty hot sector, auto fintech. Um, although I should say, regardless of what area your startup is focused on, our two guests today will have loads have loads of experience and advice that I think you'll find helpful. Um, one reminder, if you want to ask questions, head over to the hop-in link. Okay, first up, we have Kevin Bennett, CEO of Caribou, an auto fintech company that was initially called Moto Refi. Caribou is an interesting one because this startup was born out of QED investors in 2016. The company's initial focus was to develop an auto refinancing platform that handles the entire process. So think about from you know, finding the best rates to paying off the old lender to retitling uh, your vehicle. Caribou, though, has since expanded into insurance, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Joining Bennett is Rachel Holt with Construct Capital. Uh, Rachel was one of the first 30 employees at Uber and as a, was a rising executive star over at the ride-hailing company uh, when she made an angel investment in Caribou. Um, she later left Uber and in 2020 co-founded Construct Capital, an early stage venture firm focused on startups transforming most the most foundational industries in the economy. So think of manufacturing, supply chain, which is pretty important right now, logistics and transportation. Uh, today's event, we are going to talk about what founders should do before their seed round, attracting that first funding, a uh, common mistake startups um, make with their board seats. And if we have time, hopefully we'll get to some recruitment uh, questions as well. Um, this month, um, before we get into that though, this month I wanna mention that TechCrunch Live is all about mobility startups and investors. And the lineup which kicks off today is an excellent one. Next week we have Raquel Erdison who founded Wabi in 2021. She recently raised $83.5 million in a Series A. She'll be joined with uh, uh, Sven Stroban from Coastal Ventures. Uh, then the following week, we're going to have our in-person TechCrunch mobility event, which will be held in San Mateo, May 18th and 19th, with an online version on the 20th. And I do hope to see you all there. I will be there. Um, and then we're going to close out the month with, on May 25th with Mike Gaffrey of Canvas Ventures and Walker Druitt with New Breaks. So enough with the housekeeping. Um, I want to welcome Kevin and Rachel. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, all right. Uh, Kevin, I want to start with you um, with the origins of Caribou because it's, a, it's an interesting one um, since it came out of QED. How did that all begin? Yeah, it's a fun story and it's a great question. So we started as a venture build out of QED. Uh, for folks who don't know QED, they're a verticalized uh, fintech fund. Uh, really one of the best ones out there. Invested in 150 plus companies, all in fintech, a bunch of unicorns, and know the space inside and out. Founded by Nigel Morris and Frank Rotman and others from X Capital One folks. And so right out of the gate, we had the benefit of partnering up with folks who knew fintech, who knew financial services. It was really a big, big advantage getting started. Um, and was a lot of fun, really allowed us to hit the ground running uh, with a great thesis and uh, and get to meet people like Rachel and, and build from there. Um, was that fully formed, that thesis, or has it changed and evolved over time? It's been an incredibly durable thesis. I mean, the original thesis was on the core business of auto refinancing, partnering with credit unions on the capital side and acquiring customers. And, and that's actually held incredibly true. Um, and so from there, we've expanded auto insurance, as you mentioned, and have lots of uh, big plans on the horizon. But, but the early days were uh, followed pretty much according to the playbook. Before I get to Rachel, I want you to give us a breakdown of 
your fundraising for Caribou, starting with your seed um, seed round. So if you could ju just talk about the seed round, you know, briefly and when it was announced and then through series A and I believe through series B, that's when you you fundraise through. Yep, absolutely. So uh, the seed round was March of 2019, uh, just under $5 million. And that was the result and that milestone set was around early traction. So we'd commercialized, we were helping customers, they were having great experience. Uh, our credit union partners and community banks were having great experience. And then roughly a year thereafter, February of 2020, we raised our Series A. Um, the seed round was led by Accomplice. The Series A was co-led by Accomplice and Link Ventures, um, about $9 million. And then we actually raised a Series A1. Uh, I believe that was official in January 2021. That was $10 million. That was really the beginning of the scale. So we had early traction and product market fit in that Series A really starting to see scale. And then we announced in May, 2021, a $50 million Series B. There was really a true full scale round um, as we were scaling and expanding the business. And that round was led by Goldman Sachs, correct? That round was led by Goldman Sachs. Um, and they've, you know, we've been fortunate to have great investors throughout the entire uh, cycle and fortunate to have add Rachel to the board as well through the process. So I want to go even before the seed round, which is when Rachel got involved. Um, and that's always really interesting to me when a company gets involved at that early of a, um, an investor gets in, um, involved that early. So Rachel, what compelled you to invest in Caribou at that angel investment stage? Was it something specific about their pitch deck or was there something about that thesis that compelled you to invest? Yeah, it for me, it was totally about the thesis. So I was at Uber at the time. I had just spent um, almost all of, of my time in 2017 running what was Uber's big initiative around changing their relationship with drivers called this 180 Days of Change campaign. And what I learned through that is actually there's a, you know sort of a limited amount that Uber can do around, it is an open marketplace around changing earnings for drivers. Theoretically, as earnings go up, more drivers enter the platform and, and kind of they do normalize again. But what we kept seeing was just drivers' costs were um, out of whack with our expectations in certain areas. And one of the key areas that we just kept seeing time and time again was in the amount that they were paying around financing of their car. And, you know, the more, uh, you know, I, we kept seeing this and, and we didn't, there was a, some efforts that Uber had made around different vehicle financing options, but, um, you know, it really wasn't until I met Kevin that I actually understood the genesis of, of where this problem came from. And as soon as he kind of shared more about his thesis, more about what Caribou, you know, then Motor Refi, now Caribou um, was looking to solve, it was just like, this needs to exist. And frankly, and now that's that's fortunately happening, we need to get this in as many Uber drivers' hands as possible immediately because it is solving such a key pain point um, that I was seeing because drivers were telling me, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drivers were sharing. And Kevin's solution was like the perfect thing to solve, um, uh, you know, that, that challenge. Well, and that challenge is not going away. I mean, we with Uber and Lyft earnings just coming out this week, um, that's a big issue is getting drivers on the platform, driver incentives, and that that cost of ownership is now creeping up even higher because of inflationary pressures. So I imagine, Kevin, that you you might be seeing a growing business now as a result of that. Yeah, I think whether you're an Uber driver or consumer, uh, you're seeing your cost of buying a new car, a used car go up. I mean, the, it's been astronomical with supply chain issues and inflation. And those loan terms are getting longer and it's just eating more and more of your paycheck. And so there's really a need for helping, for someone to really help provide a solution for the consumer uh, or that you know rideshare driver, Uber driver around their financing, their insurance, helping optimize their finances in their auto life. And it really does make a big difference. So I want to go back to some of those early days, even before you started um, looking for funding, because you mentioned something to me the other day, um, sort of that every founder should complete uh, a, a to-do list, if you will, before going out even to the angel investment level. And I wonder if what you meant by that was that you need to have that complete thesis, or was there something else that 
you think that all founders should do before they even start having that funding question or start making those meetings with investors? It's a great question. I think one of the things that's interesting is that some rounds can happen amazingly quickly and some can take what is seemingly forever. And often that's correlated with how much work that that founder or founding team has done up front. Really about having a clear vision for what you want, a clear vision around the story you're telling, having a vision for the process, really, really being able to run a tight process uh, and have clarity around that. I think that it's all messaging, it's all data for uh, the investors you're talking with. Do you have clarity around your vision for the company, clarity around your vision for the process? What does that look like? And I'd say do your homework around funds and investors. The, the process, one of the things I learned over a number of startups is the process is actually more about discovery than persuasion. I initially thought it was about, let me find an investor, let me convince them I've got the greatest thing in the world. And I think the reality is it's about finding the right investor who's interested in the problem you're solving. And if you do that pre-work, your hit rate with investors will be much higher because you'll be talking to investors who are already interested in what you're working on. They'll have better feedback. They'll be more engaged. And I think your process will generally be more successful. At that early stage, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your relationship with um, Rachel as an angel, do, do you advise, would you tell founders, and, and maybe it's different from what your experience was, but did you lean on some of your earliest investors, your angel investors for that type of advice when you started really preparing to go out to seed round or series A? Or was this something that you had done prior to even really getting that angel investing? Um, just wondering where, how much advice were you getting from uh, the angel investment side? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I'm constantly learning, I'd say, at every step of the process. And so I would say some of this was the result of my learnings at previous startups. And a lot of it was the result of talking to Rachel and folks like her and her coming and saying, Hey, here's what, how I would tweak the vision. Here's how we did it at Uber. I went through the fundraising process at Uber with Travis and others. And this is what this looked like. And I think having that, the benefit of someone like Rachel with her depth, her expertise, her operating ability and experience is invaluable. Right? You may not be able to recruit someone like Rachel early on into your startup, but you can certainly recruit her as an investor or an advisor early and have the benefit of all of her wealth of experience and knowledge and insight. And it really makes a massive difference. It did for us. Well, that's like the perfect segue, Rachel. Um, one of the things we were talking about earlier was this idea of like the independent board seat and who, who should be filling that and if they should be filled. And something you said to me really stuck out, which is that, uh, I don't know if you said mistake, but you know, a mistake for lack of a better word that some startups make is not filling those independent board seats. And we talked a lot about who should fill those. And it sounds like with Kevin, he was looking for someone who had operational experience, which you have. Um, so why, first of all, why is it important to fill those seats? And what is it that you're seeing in the startup community um, that maybe founders are worried about filling those seats or giving up control and what's driving that? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think one of the things I will say that has stuck out about Kevin as a founder is just he's always thinking sort of two steps ahead in terms of what the company needs. And I think you know, just even even the fact that he wanted to bring on an independent board member um, early on, I think is frankly another example of that because we do uh, we do often see as boards get formed. First of all, I think there sometimes is a tendency to just say, "Let me keep the board as small as possible." Board equals you know boss. Board equals oversight, and I think that's that's just like a fundamental mindset shift that. Uh, you know, I, I hope founders can make. And frankly, I think getting good board members will help founders make that mindset shift as well, because, you know, here you are gaining, you know, and in, and in many ways sort of, you know, you have pick of the litter, right? In terms of bringing someone on who you think is going to be able to help you as a, as a founder, as a leader, as a CEO, and then help, uh, you know, further where the company can get. And it's, and it's really a way to have people be quite bought in well beyond the dollars that they may have invested as an angel investor. 
uh, or even an advisor, right? You're kind of like investor plus it often, it's sort of investor plus advisor, um, but with sort of real like fiduciary responsibility around supporting the company. And I think if you can get someone bought in on your behalf early that you think can add value, not just where you are, but where you want to go. Um, I think it can be a really fantastic way bringing in, you know, a great um, operator, I think is a really good uh, way. It's bringing in sort of a mentor, a subject matter expertise, someone who you really feel like could open the door from a customer perspective, but ultimately you want to make sure that person isn't sort of to point in time bound, but you actually feel like is going to be the person who's going to be helpful and supportive, um, and, but also challenge you where you are today and sort of where you want to be for the next two, three years. Because the, the challenging thing is it, it is very hard to circle people off boards, or it can be hard to circle people off boards. And so you do want to make sure um, you've kind of either had a very specific agreement with the vesting cycle or something like that around how long uh, the board relationship is going to take. I mean, that's something Kevin and I did. We're like, let's start with a two-year vest um, on, on initially on the board. Let's make sure it's working for you. And then, you know, we've, we've now um, sort of re-upped that um, later on because it's, you know, it's, it's a great um, experience and opportunity for both of us. Is there a, a timing sweet spot in terms of you know, setting, setting the framework and setting sort of a check-in period for the term of those board seats. You mentioned two years, but uh, what have you found? Is there, is there a perfect amount of time that especially companies at an early stage should be thinking about? I mean, I think, and again, you know, this sounds like a little bit of like a Kevin and I love fest, but like, it really is true. Like, I think Kevin does a really good job of being like, this is what I, this is what I need from you as well. And I think founders should look at their board, look at the people around as like people who are invested in supporting them. Um, and I think making those asks, again, it just, it flips the relationship. And, and this is something Kevin and I have, have talked about that evolution, right? No longer should he think about a board meeting as like, I need to update you know, my boss on, on these specific metrics or what's happening in these areas. Instead, it's like, let's reframe it as how do I gain perspectives and input that ultimately is going to help me as a CEO make better and right decisions. And I think, frankly, I, I've loved being an independent board member. It's, um, I'm also obviously as an investor, a board member on a number of my companies, but you can play this really like amazing sort of coach role um, and, and a role that helps in some cases sort of bridge between investor investors and the CEO when there are sort of issues where you're like, look, I don't have a stake in the game, right? From a, you know, in terms of, it's not my fund that's riding on whether or not this company is successful and you can, you can sort of play a different role um, in, in that, in that way. And I think good independence as you talk to people and, and sort of, uh, you know, as a CEO, you're, um, you should be asking your, uh, investors, who do they recommend? Give me a list, but ultimately you should be interviewing those folks. It's your decision, you know, as, as the CEO, particularly if it's come from an investor list. And I think this is an opportunity to kind of shoot high around the people who you think would be most helpful. And I think it really depends, like, what kind of company you are, what do you really need? Sometimes it may be, let me find the best technical person that I can possibly bring on who can also help from a, from a board perspective. And, and, you know, sometimes it might be, let me just find an operator. Let me find someone who's got a network that can help me recruit, et cetera. Great. Um, thanks for that. That's uh, should be really helpful for all those uh, founders in the audience. Uh, Kevin, I did want to try to squeeze in a couple of questions about sort of how you've expanded the business and sort of how you've scaled during COVID. So we'll try to squeeze these in before we get to your to your um, deck. Um, so Caribou recently added insurance as a service, and I'm wondering if that was part of the original thesis or through the relationship with a board members such as Rachel as an independent board member was this something that sort of was born out of um, 
maybe the original thesis, but was opportunistic and then you were able to add that. Can you just describe how you made that decision to add this whole other service that is tied to the platform, but certainly specialized? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think one of the things, there, there are certain kind of axioms or themes, I think, in especially early stage. And one of them is it's almost impossible to be too focused. It's also almost impossible not to, to be too close to your customer. And so I think we spent a lot of time with our customers. We said, how do you think about us? What else can we do? Where can we pro provide value? Auto insurance always came up. It always came up. It came up just thematically in the two biggest components of the total cost of ownership on your car are your financing and your insurance. So we knew it was a big chunk of dollars and we knew our customers were interested in it. And we also knew we had a lot of the data so we could efficiently actually deliver value via money saving quotes on insurance. And so as we, it was one of those, as we really dug into that relationship and said, okay, we've, we've earned the trust of you as a customer. We have a really high NPS. We're saving you money. What else would you want from us? Auto insurance was always the, the next thing on the list uh, from the customer point of view. And we validated that in the industry with insurance carriers and others. Uh, and it became kind of an obvious next step. And then Rachel, were you, um, how involved were you when, when Kevin started and the company started talking about this, was this something in which you felt like you needed to validate that decision? Just want to get a, a little insight into that role of the independent board member and how um, how much feedback you gave them. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I do think, you know, a board doesn't run the company, right? The CEO runs the company. And I just right. think that is so, and as a good more board members, I think, know that and believe that through and through. Um, and so ultimately, you know, it was Kevin's, it's all totally Kevin's call. Um, I think that we we certainly in board meetings and in one-on-ones talked about, okay, how how could you do this, right? Like, what are the different approaches? What are the different options? What are the different, and frameworks is not even the right word, but what are the right paths to, to make this most seamless for you? A lot of what we spent time talking about was how do you carve out a set of people on the team so this doesn't direct, uh, distract from the core business. I think what Kevin had done such a good job of is just is actually running straight at one problem and solving that and getting operationally better and better and more and more efficient at solving that problem from a company perspective, from a customer perspective. And so there's always anxiety, right, that comes from something new. Um, but it was very clear at that point that, and, and I could relay back, look, the concern, if I was looking at this as an independent investor and I was looking at doing your Series B or Series C or whatever it might be later on, my, my core question would be, is your core business big enough, right? And so it was kind of uh, inevitable, I think, that they were going to figure out the right next adjacency. I think the question was, is this the right next one and what is the path to do it? And I think that was much more um, where our conversations sort of lay and our focus was. Yeah. Got it. And I double click on that, just one piece of it, which sure. is, I think that resonates so much. Rachel as an operator, as someone who had built, built at scale, built quickly, seen tremendous traction and growth in the team she led at Uber knew the importance of us. This was an expansion, not a pivot. The core business was working and we were adding something else. So how do we make sure we continue to grow the core business and launch something new, but not have it be distraction or slow us down? And, and that you know, advice and guidance she offered us uh, as a team was, was just invaluable. It really was. Well, I should mention though, that this expansion was happening in the midst of the COVID pandemic um, in which the entire way we work changed for, for many companies. So very briefly, can you talk about how you accomplished that? And did you have to fundamentally change your business um, practices, not your business, but your business practices, as far as recruiting and bringing in um, and getting those employees up to speed and integrated in the, into the companies? Because for our audience should know, you have gone from about 40 core employees to more than 500 now in a pretty short span, a few years. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it was certainly not something we were planning for, nor was anyone else. Um, I, I think a couple of things helped us. One, 
we already had some remote employees. We already knew how to onboard and do some things remote. Not not at that scale, but we already we had a little bit of the muscle already developed. Two, we had a very clear mission and very clear values and a very clear culture. And so I think what helped us was that we had a value proposition that was pretty robust for talent. Yes, we had the standard comp and, and everything that you would expect at a startup. And we had a clear mission, purpose, values that folks and culture that folks found attractive. What, at a moment when they were really, that, that was, it wasn't just like we show up in the same office. And I think at a moment when people were really looking for that, and I think they still are, I think people are re-examined what they do with their lives and all kinds of things. We were able to say, look, we, we're doing a lot of good in the world. We're building a great business, but we're helping consumers and helping our stakeholders. And, and we care a lot about each other and our values. And I think that was pretty instrumental in allowing us to attract some great talent and really punch above our weight um, when it came to bringing just true talent to the company. Got it. I'll also add one thing there. I think um, Kevin and I had a bunch of conversations like right as the pandemic was hitting. And I think, frankly, it was really helpful for me not to have a whole portfolio of companies at the time, because I think you know, every investor was having, you know, was immediately having the conversation with their whole, whole portfolio that was like, you know, the, oh, you know, crap conversation, right? Like what is happening? We need to buckle down. We need to hunker down. We need to save capital. We don't know how hard it's going to be to, to, to fundraise. We don't know when the next milestones are going to be. And Kevin and I had the conversation of like, wait, 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 like your business should accelerate right now because you're in a position where like people really, everyone else, the whole conversation is about how to save money. Like you produce a really, really attractive way for people to save money. Oh, and by the way, if people are, you know, I, and I certainly uh, could see this from following Uber very closely, no one is get, getting on the subway, no one's getting on yeah. the metro, no one's getting in a rideshare car, they're going to want the, to keep their personal car. And so I actually think it's where not having had a portfolio, we could have a, a slightly different conversation, I think, than maybe... Um, was immediately easy for, for Kevin to have with his investors who frankly were just having so, and they were amazing investors, by the way, it has nothing to do with, with Kevin's team, but they're having the same conversation with 10, 15, 20 companies around their portfolio. And, and there's a lot of value in taking the insights between 15, 20 companies and being able to, to, to gather those. But I think in this case, it was also insight in being able to say, let's have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation around your business and say, if let's see, and of course, no one knew this was going to play out, obviously, for two years. Um, none of us, you know, we thought this would be a two-month thing. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But let's, but let's talk about how we can capitalize on those two months because we're presented with this amazing opportunity around really being part of the money-saving conversation. Great. Well, um, before we get to pitch practice, I do want to go back in time to your pitch deck. I believe this is your series A, Kevin. So I'm going to hand over the reins to you. There's about eight slides and we have about 10 minutes um, to go through this and then we'll, we'll go to uh, pitch practice. Perfect. Let's do it. Right. So formerly known as Motor Refi, this was uh, the quick summation of, of the series A deck. And if we'll click over to the first slide, after the cover. One of the things we'll see is that this was all about defining the problem. One of the things that was really important for us, and I think for all founders, early on in the conversation is, what is the problem and why does it matter? And the problem was clearly that custom, consumers are overpaying on their auto loans. It is a problem that originates at the dealer. There are misaligned incentives. Cars are co commoditized. And therefore, you know, dealers are making their money on financing the insurance products. And there's this opportunity to save consumers money. And so it get, got to the why, to the what, right? You, you nail all of that up front in a clear way is really important. We use a lot of data to try and generate some credibility, say, hey, we understand the space. And then also on the lending side, what's the opportunity? You have these great community banks and credit unions. They have customers in mind. They're focused on the customer, the best rates. 
but often they're not as user friendly because they don't have either the budgets to invest in technology or the capabilities or the scale. And we have the opportunity to play this matching marketplace role. And it just becomes clear, even when you're looking at the problem, that you can see kind of where it's heading in a defining way that's really clear, really simple. I will say it's not the prettiest deck in the world, obviously, but I think we tried to be very clear in the way we laid it out. If we go to the next slide, going to the solution. So it is that matching marketplace. We show us in the middle that we're kind of making it easy for consumers delivering a fast and easy process in that matching marketplace, saving them $100 a month, NPS, that's kind of, you know, that 80, 81% like will score really, really quite high and shows kind of, all right, here's what the consumer gets. Here's what the lender gets. Here's why it matters. If we head over to that next slide, part of, and then Rachel alluded to this, the question around TAM, some of the early questions we had is, hey, is it a big enough market, right? Is this a niche market? Like it clearly resonates with customers. You clearly have traction. They're happy. They're saving money. Your lenders are happy. How big can this be? And part of what we had to do, would do is draw a very clear through line of here's the market today. Here are the number of cars. Here's the opportunity. But here are the number of cars that refinance today. And here's actually the number of people who should refinance, which is many times the size of, of the you know, market of the people who actually do today. And if you actually look at the latent demand in the market, all the people who could save money, all the people, if you unlock an easier value at scale, all the people you could help, that gets to be a tremendous market. And that was a really important point. And I think you know, understanding what are the likely questions an investor is going to have or, and, and try and answer those before they ask them, work them into your deck. This was one of those slides where we just knew they'd say, okay, but how big is the TAM? And we really worked that into the deck up front. Next slide, you know, always have to show the product itself, you know, and so part of what we wanted to show is in a few quick screens, it's easy for the customer and there's a very clear value we're delivering on and, and making it real for the investor is really important, whether that's a demo up front or just a few screenshots early on, it feels like table stakes to have that in the slide. Finally, delivering for the customer, right? That 81 NPS, hearing from customers in their own words that we're saving them money, we're making it easy. Again, I think that kind of emotional resonance that you can deliver that, that there's some magic here. There are some amount of customers who have an incredible experience and are very happy with your product and you have some early traction and you're getting the, to scale, but, but they believe that this is something that's replicable. Really, really important. So I had that in there as well. And I think finally, one of the things we wanted to show is this vision toward expansion right? That there's more that we could do, that auto insurance was a perfect opportunity. And this slide is kind of a mini deck in itself, right? It says, all right, what's in it for the customer? What's in it for the carrier? Why can, why us? Why are we positioned to do it? What's the opportunity? And so we didn't want to go too deep because investors are busy, as, as Rachel will tell you, they're going to spend 30 seconds flipping through a deck, right? Initially. And laying it out very clearly, here's the next phase of what we can do. And that vision is growing and expanding and powerful and compelling um, was, was really, really important. So um, I, I know we uh, have to get to, to some really exciting pitches and I'm excited to do that. So I wanted to run through this quickly, but I think these are a couple slides that are really important kind of, and I think we're really instrumental in our series A uh, to uh, getting that done and beyond. I did have a couple of quick follow-up questions and we have a couple minutes. Um, that last slide, was that your starting point? When you were building your deck, did you use that as sort of the, um, the nut, if the nut graph which in journalism terms, if you will, that like gives everything immediately or, or did you start at a different point when you started building the, the deck? Well, I think we started with the core, you know, there's, there are a million templates out there for these decks, right? Of the problem, the solution, all that. We did some version of that. I think for insurance, what we wanted to do is distill it down and really drive clarity. I think one of the things that's easy if you are a, a founder or founding team, a CEO, is there's so much going on. You are so deep in a problem set that you could just speak forever on a topic or put a slide that has a trillion words on it, right? Or whatever. And, and really some of the alchemy and the magic is distilling it down. It's about what you remove so that you only have just the most salient points. And so if we were trying to convince ourselves, you put yourself you know, in, in the investor's shoes, 
just help me understand what this is, right? And what is it for the customer? What is it for the carrier? And go through, you know, that type of process. Um, again, it's not like the most visually beautiful slide, but we tried to drive toward clarity and, and why it was compelling. Before we go to pitch practice, Rachel, I just wanted to get a, a few comments from you. Was Go back in time, if, if you, hopefully this was a little bit of a refresher, but is there anything that stands out in the deck that, um, was particularly good or even particularly bad at the time? Well, we went we went and did take a walk down memory lane around the C deck and this one is a lot better. Um, so uh, that's, um, look, I think what, what stands out to me about this is the problem is very clear, right? And it's easy, I think, for founders sometimes to spend a really, really, really long time explaining the problem, which is sometimes a red flag of like, how niche is this problem versus how mainstream is this problem? And then two, I think um, the, the fact that they actually explained what the product does, I cannot tell you the number of times I see a deck where, or a pitch or a have a conversation with a founder where like we're 15 minutes in and I'm like, time out. Can you just tell me what does your, what does your product do? Um, and I think to Kevin's point, this all just comes from being so deep in, uh, in our own, <clears throat> in our own startup or in our own company that it's very hard to say, okay, how would someone look at this with fresh ish eyes to the space? Um, and what would that, you know, what would, what, what would I need to explain, um, for that to be really clear? And then I think finally, you know, as you look at the, the insurance slide, um, you know, we, we've called that, and I think Kevin and I have used this framing like the end then vision. That's what we always call it at, at Construct. And I'll, I'll tell founders as I'm coaching them now on going out for rounds after we, um, you know, after we invest saying, okay, that ideally that is like a one to two slide piece because you want the majority of the business to really be all about, here's what we're doing today. Here's why we are winning today. But you want to leave investors sort of uh, dreaming about how big the business could become. And I think a really good, crisp sort of and then slide um, talks about, uh, and I think in a very concrete way, this is what we could do next. This is what can come after um, in a way that maybe you don't even get to the slide, but you want investors to leave believing you as a founder have long-term vision. Because I always say like vision is what's going to help you recruit the team, right? It's going to help you and it's going to help you fundraise, right? It's going to help you share where, where can this go and sort of dream. But, but ultimately execution today is what's going to get you there. And I think, you know, you want a founder that can have that, that you, that can do both. Um, and I think how you frame that and communicate that in the deck and sort of the relative, the clarity and relative importance you give to each does speak to what kind of founder you are. Um, and are you gonna overlook today just because of the future? And maybe that suggests, are you gonna be able to execute today? But you don't want someone who's just thinking small, thinking myopic, because they're never gonna get a great team. They're never gonna be able to sell other investors. Interesting. Uh, well, thank you so much for that insight. I think that's super helpful. Um, and thank you, Kevin, for sharing, for sharing that. Uh, so now it's time for pitch practice, which is, Super exciting. Um, and just a reminder to our three founders who are going to be um, coming on here, um, make sure your mic and camera are on. You'll have two minutes to make your pitch. And then Rachel and Kevin will have four minutes. There will be a timer, so just consider that. And um, first up, we have Sonia Cabra, a co-founder and CEO of a company called Boo Pass. Sonia, if you're all set, you can take it Hi. away whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, I hope my connection is good. Yep. All right. Great. Hi, I'm Sonia Cabra, co-founder and CEO at Bupas. Domestic travel and transport in Africa is undigitized and broken. Transport operators have manual processes to do their sales. While on the other hand, commuters cannot book their tickets or parcels to, to, to make their travel bookings. Even though, um, even though 
solutions such as M-Pesa or mobile money are very, uh, are very popular in Sub-Saharan Africa. What Bupas is doing is building a B2B2C full stack marketplace for the Sub-Saharan transport industry and solving a uh, $100 billion, uh, billion dollar value chain. Uh, on the side, think of us as a toast or, uh, uh, or uh, a square for transport operators where they have an operating system to do their ticketing uh, connected to a point of sale. And on the B2C side, we are more of an Expedia for booking your bus and shuttle tickets. So far, we have sold more than 6 million tickets, processed more than $70 million in GMV. And we started off as student entrepreneurs by winning the $1 million grant called the Health Prize in 2017. We are live in Kenya and Uganda, and we are raising $3 million in, um, in seed funding to expand to eight new countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and 10x our growth in order to be ready to, uh, for our price round in 2022. Look at you. You have 20 seconds left on the board. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you, uh, Sonia. Uh, Rachel or Kevin, do you want to, who wants to start? We have four minutes um, to give some feedback. Kevin, you want to start? Sure. Well, one, a great pitch, great job. Uh, I thought it was really clear. Doing uh, a pitch without visuals can be really challenging. And I thought I could almost see the deck in the pitch you were giving slide by slide. So I thought it was it was really effective. Um, the, the only thing that I picked up on or had a little bit of trouble following was there, was there were some multiple analogies around the same solution on diff different sides of the marketplace. I totally, yeah. but I think at least from an auditory perspective, thinking about, okay, it's like this for X and this for Y, it was just a little bit hard to follow, but I think generally it was a great pitch. You were very clear um, about each of those slides about the market, what you're using the capital for, who your customers were, what the solutions, what the competitors and substitutes were. Um, I, I thought it was really compelling. Quick question for you, Kevin. You. Would you suggest then using just one analogy? Because it's a little different, difficult with a B2B to B to C um, uh, product. Yeah, I, I, one of two ways to handle it. Either try to figure out one kind of global analogy that would work, which I understand is very difficult, and that's why you're using two. Uh, the other would be to try and give the enough enough airtime to each side of the marketplace and, and to try and draw the analogy there. And obviously, a short pitch, two minutes, but you even had 20 seconds left. So I, if you use those 20 seconds, I'd use them to kind of really dig another 10 seconds maybe into each side of the marketplace to understand why that analogy is right from that side of the marketplace maybe. Um, okay. but, but generally, I mean, this is really nitpicky. I, I thought it was, it was a great pitch. Great. Um, Rachel, I'm going to hand it over to you. And then Sonia, maybe mute your mic in between because there's a little bit of background noise. Great. All right, Rachel, go for it. Yeah, I thought um, very similar to Kevin. I thought you you got a tremendous amount covered in your time, um, and I think you know really neatly hit on validation of you know what what the uh, market was, um, where you were live, what the progress you had made to date is, where you want to go from a growth perspective, um, uh, where your uh, GMV is today, um, and I think often those things uh, are skipped. Uh, my only feedback is kind of similar to Kevin is I would I would relatively spend more time on describing what the product is. Um, I think you did that in the, with analogies. And when I hear we're going to build Toast and Expedia, it's easy as an investor to be like, whoa, they're trying to do everything. And so kind of like pass because it's like you want to first understand what is the core, you know, what is the small product that they are and this uh pain point that is being solved today. I think the other thing is really making sure you said kind of domestic traffic and tickets. I didn't hear, and I may have missed it, but was trying not to, um, you know, what kind of tickets are we talking about? Bus, train, airline, just some examples. Cause I think the more you can frame it, even an investor's mind of like what the, um, where you would go as a customer towards uh, using your particular product, I think the better. And so I would relatively speaking, probably at you at about 20 seconds left, I would probably have spent almost 30 seconds. I would 
additional um, just on this is this is the product. Um, and then once you once you get that, then you can just like check, check, check around the traction in a way that's just like super validating. Um, and I think that that part you did a you did a great job on. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. Rachel, great, um, great advice there. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're going to move on to our next company. And it is Marco uh, Pirangeli. The company is Moonable. And Marco, um, once you have your, I see you, your camera and mic's ready to go. Yeah. Um, as soon as you're ready, we will take it away. Three, two, one, and you're off. Thank you. So one of the three problems in the financial ecosystems and technology, uh, which takes in globalization, uh, that are dominating role in the modern society are the most financial services provide requirements that keep multiple communities from being a part of the financial ecosystem. Traditional banking system makes a global transaction needlessly complex due to currency conversion, lengthy weights, and interoperability between certain countries. And cryptocurrency have gained uh, public regulatory acceptance uh, and financial institutions have been resistant to embrace, embrace this financial model. Uh, Moonable is a technological and financial institution created with objective of providing access to individuals and businesses focused uh, on expats by providing multiple financial instruments using crypto, IBAN accounts, GBP, and USD accounts to allow, uh, allow them to manage uh, daily expenses, pay employees and vendors, and using batch payment tools and access debit card providing worldwide access to their money and pay travel expenses, online vendors, among others. Um, there's another solution for enterprises that is, uh, or platform can be wide label and offers a plug and play solution to, offer, uh, to be offered uh, to other fintechs. Our market, uh, it's uh, well more than 50% of the population transact through financial services provided by banks. Um, as December 29, 2021, global crypto market capitalization was 2.21 trillion and total number of global expats amounted uh, to be around 66.2 million in 2017. So it's uh, basically our, uh, our business model is the financial fiat model, cryptocurrency model, perfect for crypto investors, and the software as a, as a service licensing model, ideal for financial entrepreneurs. Great, two minutes, two minutes to spare. Um, Kevin or Rachel, it's in tech, so Kevin's kind of up your alley a little bit, although different, certainly a different application. But Rachel, I don't, I wasn't sure if you wanted to jump in first. No, 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 go for it. This is up, Kevin's. Sure. Uh, well, appreciate it. Thanks for the time, and you know, fascinating space. Obviously, really kind of timely, and so I think really exciting. And it sounds like a massive opportunity. What I'd want to know more and really drill into is I would, this is one of those cases where I'd say, think smaller, not bigger. What specifically is the solution at what niche in the market? Where is the traction or where are, or what's your go-to-market if, if, if you haven't gone to market yet? Just really get focus and dig deep in, in the very specifics. What are you doing that's different? Those types of things. I think it, obviously everything you said sounded massive, and that's both. I think a green flag and and, and a yellow flag in some ways, which is it, it just felt so massive, and I couldn't almost grab on to anything specific. And so conceptually fascinating, really interesting, sounds exciting. I just would want to know very concrete details that I would kind of sprinkle in there and clarity around. This is specifically the product for this niche. Here's how we expand, et cetera. Um, but over to Rachel. Um, Kevin, real quick question. Would you suggest that he starts with a very specific, narrow focus and you know, application as a, sort of an analogy to simplify it and then expand from there? Or is that too confusing? Yeah, no, I, I think this kind of dovetails on Rachel's advice uh, a minute ago, which is some of the most compelling pitches and stories start very specific and say, I'm, so, I'm solving a very specific problem for this very specific segment in, in, a, in a unique way, but the opportunity is massive, right? So really, really small, really specific. And actually, I believe that I can go to market in a really focused way. And I'm focused on, on really nailing a problem that someone else hasn't solved before. Um, 
or have a more compelling solution. And then the, the application of that specific solution is large, or then I can expand into multiple markets or in multiple products. But but I think nailing the focus and, and kind of the, the deep dive aspect of it's really important. Great. Rachel? Yeah, I think that's that's really great advice. I think in this particular case, the crypto market is so enormous and any investor who you talk to knows that. I would I would strip out anything. You know, you had a global crypto as however many trillion dollars. You know, I think at this point that sort of everyone gets that. And if you're talking to someone who doesn't, you probably are talking to the wrong investor. So I think um, I, I would sort of uh, to, to, to Kevin's point, given how much stuff is happening here, I would just try and really show, you know, when X product happened in the web two world, right? This is what was enabled. We're now bringing that into the crypto market, right? In a way that enables X that wasn't possible before, or this isn't possible in the real world market. And therefore this is pot, you know, with traditional financial institutions, therefore we're going to use crypto to enable X and just get really, really tight on what that is. The, the, the other, the other thing I'll add um, is I heard it was for individuals, but then I heard employees and I was like, wait, is it for individuals? Is it for companies? And I got a little, I think you probably meant employees maybe of individuals, but I was, I'm actually still not entirely sure. So I think getting really, you know, even thinking about the small words in which if it was like household staff, just be like household staff instead of employees, if that's what you meant, because otherwise you're like, wait, am I talking about a business? And you're trying very quickly to, to listen. So just think about even the like details of the words in that, in that framing. Great. Thank you so much. That was really great feedback. And hopefully you found that helpful as well. Thank you very um, much. Marco, thanks. All, All right. right. Well, um, moving on to our last founder. Uh, this is Sean um, Sakarin. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce the last name, uh, who is founder of Nick's Whistle. And Sean, if you are ready to go, um, we'll start the countdown clock and start in one. Go for it. Sure. I, as employee, have reported fraud, faced retribution. So employees are not trusting hotline systems. They are going to anonymous sites. Our Nick's Whistle Ethics Blockchain for employers assures employee reporting anonymity in a tamper-proof, with the tamper-proof investigations, rewarding right reports through crypto. Spent 10 years with Microsoft IBM, Bootstrap, Software as a Service, GRC Pioneer, Fixnix for nine years. Got mentioned by Gartner as a top regulatory technology platform. Now in the second venture of mine, we are trying to enable corporations to listen to all voices. All banks got penalized $348 billion over the past 22 years with 7,000 reports from whistleblowers. So banks are trying to encourage people to speak internally. Three years of our R&D have got us to R3 Accelerator. R3 is invested by top 20 global banks. We are also working with a publishing major to help 20 of their pub publications provide this as an ethics reporting system. 98% of the Fortune 1000 and 2500 banks are regulated by Sarbanes-Oxley to provide a ethics blockchain system for whistleblowers. And uh, we are having a fantabulous team to support this. Nitin, the man behind IBM blockchain is our advisor. We have got eight engineers and uh, have been building this for past three years. We have raised, uh, already got a commitment from plug and play, looking to raise a million dollars to go to market. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So an interesting blockchain whistleblower product, um, it sounds like. So we can continue with the same order as before. Kevin, do you want to start? Or, or Rachel, do you want to kick this one off? Rachel, you, I'm, start. I'm happy to start. Um, okay, Rachel, go for it. Yeah, so I think um, uh, super, um, I think really interesting business, really compelling value proposition. Um, I think uh, in, in terms of the 
and, and I think I get it, right? In terms of the pitch, I do think I would probably reorder it a little bit, um, which is start, you know, you had this great line like 45 seconds in, which is, you know, about um, really kind of saying the solution that you're enabling employees to communicate more effectively. And I think just starting at the beginning, I think that's also one of those sort of head nod, um, a little bit of head nod, right? Everyone knows, and you can start that way. Everyone knows it's critical for employees, uh, employers to have a way to surface, whether it's you know complaints, whistleblowers, et cetera. Employees tend to not trust the systems that exist today. And so we are creating the most trusted solution for that. And I would just start there. And then I would go into, so how are we going to do that? We're doing that by using, you know, blockchain technology, the same thing that people now trust that, you know, in, in a, in a crypto world, we're now bringing that in and we're making that mainstream in this context. And so then I would kind of, I, I would, I would, um, sort of accelerate from there. Um, and I think that you had a lot of stats and a lot of numbers, um, but I, but I didn't get, I just want that 15 seconds, 20 seconds at the beginning. And then I think I would be so much more able to listen to all the numbers and all of the stats on how, on how you're doing it, because I would know what you're doing super clearly. Sure, that's it. That was very useful. So in fact, we had a storyline about Boeing, uh, how Boeing did not listen to one of their uh, senior technical fellow, which led to the 737 MAX issue, uh, 346 deaths and $2.5 billion penalty. But uh, because of two minutes, I thought, okay, I'll skip that particular story. I wouldn't do that. We all know the Boeing MAX was a huge issue. I would just, you know, people know companies need it, you know, whether you, you know, you, you only needed to talk to someone at Boeing to show how important that is. Move on. You know, we all kind of know what issue you're talking about. Don't waste any time talking about another company. Give me all the time on what you're doing. So it sounds like keeping, keeping that analogy real brief, Rachel, and then moving, getting to the heart of it. Kevin, did you have, did you have anything to add? So I, it's great advice. I, I, I think just upfront, Intuitively, I love what you're working on. I think it's really interesting. And it's really about just clarity up front around here to, to Rachel's point. Here's the problem. The problem is trust in this very important issue. We can bring trust and it's actually worth X dollars in wasted X or, or cost of Y or regulatory, you know, costs or whatever it is. And Here's how, and then I think it allows you to move forward to your vision for commercialization and kind of here's how we go to market. This is the plan. This is what we'll do with the capital, like all of that. I think what you really want is the investor to say, I understand the problem. It resonates. I understand the solution. It resonates. And I think this person has a vision kind of to Rachel's point on where the market's going to go and where the solution can go. And so I, I would, it's one of those, I would just focus like, like a laser on a couple key things and making sure you get those early head nod moments where you just can tell it's resonating because you build momentum in a pitch. And so that's first 10, 15, 20 seconds. And the first piece is critical. So get kind of the easy wins, make it as simple as possible. And you can build complexity if you need to throughout a pitch. Thank you. I actually had a question for, for very briefly, Kevin or Rachel, you can grab it, but it kind of applies to all the, the decks we saw today. The last one, um, he wove in the background of expertise that he has in terms of staff um, and where the roots of the company come from. Heard a little bit about that from Sonia, not so much Marco. Where, where should that fit? Should it always be in there? Um, particularly if maybe they have like this great resume, maybe one of the co-founders or, or should it focus more on the product? I think it's important um, to validate that you have the right team to solve this particular problem, right? That's going to be something an investor, you know, we, we think about sort of product market fit. I actually think um, founder market fit is super important as well. Um, and less of just like, what is the resume of the founder, but more, you know, we've solved this problem in this space and we're turning our attention here, or we've assembled, I think validating, we've assembled a team that understands X, Y, and Z 
very important. You're not going to do that much of that in two minutes. And so I think actually the, the team's hit on sort of the right validation. I think if you are a second time entrepreneur, that's really important. I think it's great to get that in, even in a two minute um, pitch, again, just building um, inevitability behind what you're doing is what you're trying to say. And one way to build inevitability around the success is to show you've got a team, already a team that's assembled, that understands and has the right expertise to solve it. But I wouldn't spend much time going into the backgrounds deeply unless that's kind of the, unless it's like a pre-seed and really the only thing people are buying at that point is, is you guys and the team, which may be the case, We've certainly made investments like that where you're just basically investing in the team and their ability to figure it out. Yeah. Got it. Kevin, did you have something to add before we wrap up? So totally agree. I, I think when, at least early in a pitch, it's most, think about like what's most critical in the sequencing, most critical that someone understands the problem, the solution, then I think the scale and then the kind of why you, that founder market fits. So, and the why now piece is also important. So why this problem, why the solution, why now, why you is, is a good kind of framework to, to kind of test against as you look at your, your pitch or your deck. Um, and, and I think the, the team can be a very compelling part of that. But, but I'd say unless it is 90% of the story, then I'd probably err on the side of understanding the problem solution first and making sure that's clearly communicated. That's great. Well, that's great actionable advice. Um, I want to thank our pitch practice founders, Sonia, Marco, and Sean for joining us. It's always a little bit scary when you have to share that um, pitch at, uh, right on the fly, but I thought all of you did great. Um, and then of course, Kevin and Rachel, thanks for taking an hour out of your day to share your insights, talk about your early origin story, and uh, really excited to see, Rachel, what you invest in next, and Kevin, what happens with Caribou. Um, and of course, thanks to the audience. Um, you can join us every Wednesday for TechCrunch Live, so we will see you next week. 